Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, let's start with the promise of AI. All of you are working on very novel projects and interesting projects. What, what is exciting to you in the field right now? You, you, you go. Kick it <laughs> off. All right. Um, how about we go in order, Richard? Why don't you? All right. Uh, I'm super excited about AI. Uh, on many different levels. So on the one hand, um, I'm most excited about the whole spectrum that it covers and that it goes from really what tells us, uh, something that tells us what makes us human, which is to a large degree our intelligence. So it's almost philosophical and it will change the entire human condition just like agriculture changed the entire human condition from hunting and gathering and, and that kind of level. And then it spans the spectrum all the way to being directly useful in products, in uh, medicine and agriculture in, of course, like sales service marketing where, you know, uh, in both positive, uh, positive ways. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, AI for good applications. Uh, we can help uh, analyze our oceans better with artificial intelligence. Uh, we can do uh, find new drugs uh, and develop new kinds of molecules. So it really spans pretty much every single industry. Uh, and I'm excited about the breadth uh, that sometimes the same underlying uh, techniques can actually have in terms of their applications. So I'm going to take the sort of philosophical nature up a notch a little bit and say that the most interesting thing about AI is that it makes us question very fundamental things that we were unable to question before. For example, why is our GDP structured the way it is? Do we actually really have to work? You know, why, why, do, why do we not take care of elderly people and children as much as maybe we'd like to in our lives, right? Do we actually have to have a 40 hour plus week? Um, does my commute have to be so long? So we get to re relearn and re-ask very fundamental questions that our society has been built on. Now, that's not necessarily the way it's headed and it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion of the technology. It's why I have the job I do is um, respons in responsible AI. It's actually to push us and nudge us in that direction. So rather than thinking about the technology just as a way of automating things or you know, getting flashy new tech, let's actually think about it as a fundamental force of nature and a way of just changing everything we do. And that, that I think, is the most exciting thing about AI. Look, I think for me, the most um, exciting piece of AI is, um, is really that um, it thinks differently to us. And I think that we get to create this intelligence that's sort of like not human. And, and, and it's, I think we've been so used to kind of having human kind of perspective on the world. And all of a sudden, there's this intelligence that can do things that we can't. Now, it doesn't mean it's necessarily smarter than us, but it certainly can do things that we can't do. And in a sense, we're going to have to make friends with this new kind of intelligence that we um, are different to, that we've suddenly kind of got on the scene and all of a sudden has these capabilities that we don't have. And for me, that's incredibly exciting. Of course, it's a little bit scary, but we get to kind of, um, you know, see how another intelligence observes the world. And, you know, my background as a physicist, um, we'd always come up against the limits of what we knew about what the world, um, how the world worked. And to have another intelligence out there that could see things that we can't see or be able to explain things that we couldn't biologically do is incredibly exciting. So I think you know, coming into this, um, you know, for all the kids that are coming into the world today, there's going to be an intelligence um, that is smarter than them on, on a bunch of things that is going to be able to tell them a whole um, range of things about how the world is. And maybe, maybe to riff on that, I think the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence is probably language. Like animals have visual intelligence too, they have motor control, they can do some rudimentary planning and things like that, but uh, no other animal has a language as complex as ours. So in terms of the research uh, that we do in our research group, I'm really excited about natural language processing, basically trying to automatically improve translation, summarization, question answering, understanding the sentiment on social media. There's so many different exciting uh, natural language processing applications and that AI has made a huge amount of progress in, in the last couple of years. So what are some applications that like, you know, all of us might have in our pockets right now? So one, one thing that we're working on directly are chatbots and uh, an Einstein voice assistant is what we call it, where you can walk out of a meeting and you can just dictate everything about that meeting and like follow-ups you need to do and things like that. And it will just do the speech recognition, then do natural language processing, extract the important entities, and then it can update your database for you. And that takes, you know, uh, a lot of annoying part out of using a CRM uh, away because you can now, you don't have to go back to your desk and type it all up. You can just, you know, do it as you walk out of the meeting. And so I think 
what's exciting about AI and NLP applications is that it will allow you to scale uh, certain capabilities that we just currently cannot scale. Like, not everybody can have a personal assistant. We'd need twice the people in the world um, for each person to have an assistant, and the assistant wants an assistant, and it doesn't really work, right? And so... Um, I and hate so, it when my assistant wants an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, with AI, uh, there are there's certain kinds of tasks, at least, obviously not all kinds of tasks, but certain tasks that AI can do for us. So I'm pretty sure in the next couple of years when you call your insurance company uh, and you have some question about a claim, you don't have to say like, oh, press three when you want this and four when you want that. You just say what you want and you get an answer that is right. And so I think it will, and, and then you can use those same kinds of ideas to basically schedule like, your next vacation and, and all these kinds of things and have AI to help, uh, help you do a lot of things that are basically not fun. And, I think maybe last point, the tricky bit there is that sometimes those things are current people's jobs, like driving. And uh, when I think we look into the past, uh, now nobody here in the room is bummed out that they weren't working in the field, like today, because those are not fun jobs. And we just like, you know, when tractors came around, people are like, well, what else are we going to do? This is all we knew. Now the tractor is going to automate that. And I think in 100 years from now, we'll probably think about uh, that similarly to, uh, like what we think now about truck driving, where for most people, probably in 100 years, truck driving is also not that fulfilling of your job. You sit by yourself on the road, you go you know, on the, on the streets straight, and you ask for sometimes hundreds of miles. It's not that fulfilling and fun of a job. And I think AI will kind of make us rethink those jobs. So thinking about AR, or sorry, AI that's in your pocket, um, and also thinking about what's coming next with AI. One of the most exciting things, I think, is AI plus. So AI plus AR and VR. It's going to be really, what's, really. What are oh, AR and VR? AR, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality, right? So especially augmented reality. So the new iPhones actually have better augmented reality capabilities, meaning that and there are plenty of people in San Francisco who work in this space. Slowly, we will see this melding of the, the virtual and the real. And you know, if you, so one really basic example would be something like Pokemon Go, right? If you had like the, the thing, the app on your phone and you can play it and it looks like there's like, you know, Pikachu sitting over there and it's cute and it's fun, but you can really imagine how you might start to think about that in terms of having a meeting with your team or imagine FaceTime being like, you know, as if you could see your family, at, you know, in three dimensions instead of just on a flat screen. So. It is not necessarily in our pockets today, but the seeds of it are in our pockets today. And that, that I think will be something very exciting. Thinking about, as you were saying, about like the next generation growing up. I mean, most of us, I think some of us in this room, most of us in this room, hopefully, otherwise I'm pretty old, um, remember a pre-internet and post-internet, hopefully, yeah. Okay, we all remember a pre-iPhone and post-iPhone era, but it just seems so natural. But to talk to people or kids who don't really remember a pre a pre smartphone era or you know young adults who don't really remember a pre internet era it's like but it, it all just happens so seamlessly and it seems so easy and integrated and i think that's going to be the next seamless easy integration that's going to make us all feel much older <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was following a thread um, on, on Twitter, and it was it was this um, question. I was like, what did you all do before the internet when you had like when you had, had a question? When you had a question, <laughs> and it was like this whole litany of stuff. It's like, I don't know. I guess we just um, encyclopedias. We, we we talked about it, and we um, and then we were like, I guess we won't know until tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and it was just like, we just lived ignorant. It was like, <laughs> scratched our heads. It was like, it was like, it was like I don't know how high is Mount Kilimanjaro. I guess we won't know until I go to the library. <laughs> And it's just, just kind of like, it seems like perverse. It's like, well, well, of course we know it's on the phone. I've got it, right? So the, the next thing is going to be like, you know, what, what's it going to be like having to, um, you know, uh, ask and, and uh, you know, a more complex question. Like, you know, tell me, how is um, Syria going to unfold in the next 12 months? And be like, imagine when we didn't know how that was going to happen, right? You know, and so it's that kind of like thing as AI evolves and it moves up from being a sort of a basic librarian to being able to kind of take information, actually synthesize it, figure out what's going on, maybe even start to predict the things that are unfolding next and then give that back to you in the form of an assistant in your pocket. We'll be, you know, in 10 years' time having that same question. Remember when we didn't know that 
that you know what was going to happen in Syria? So how would AI know what's going to happen in Syria? Walk me through that. I would love to know. <laughs> good, good question. <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting. So one of the things that, that we as humans, when we observe the world, we observe it through a very narrow lens, which is dictated by the, the biological constraints that the brain has, right? So things that look very messy to us or very chaotic are often actually quite um, structured at a higher level that we can't actually observe. So you start building AIs and training them to observe the world at a superhuman level, all of a sudden they observe patterns. And so one of the patterns that's observed, this is work that I did my PhD in, was around the kind of the patterns of violence as it unfolds in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's actually very, very strong patterns in both the timing and the size and the geographic diffusion of violence that are actually quite predictable. But when you're on the ground there, they seem chaotic. And so it's interesting, right? You build these systems that can see beyond human capabilities to tell you things you wouldn't otherwise have seen. And that's kind of where that dynamic um, and I think the world actually has a lot more of these. I think the world is a lot more repeatable than we observe, but it seems like, you know, us as little kind of pieces of a Brownian motion kind of buffered in kind of statistical physics, right? I mean, that's basically how most of data science and AI, most of the companies in Silicon Valley are built on the concept of predictive modeling, right? I use data, I put it into an algorithm, I make a prediction about someone's behavior, whether it's these might be the shoes you're gonna buy, this might be the movie you want to watch, but imagine that sort of applied at a, at a bigger scale, and that's why we're having the conversations we're having today about AI and ethics. We've moved beyond making, not, not just making predictions, but nudging behavior, like sort of implying that somebody should do something, but that's now moving into things like making decisions about whether you can have a loan uh, for, to buy a house. So things that are more impactful than just consumerism. And then the stuff there, the, the, the bit there, there was a paper that was published in Nature. It was around looking at, remember this, um, the images of eyes, and they were looking for defects in the eyes. And the, 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 um, the machine that was trained could recognize the gender of someone looking at the iris. And, Human doctors looked at that and said, there's no way you can do that. It, it, it doesn't exist. And the machine's like, no, you know, at 90, 90 plus percent precision and recall on this, we've got it. And we still don't quite know what they were seeing, right? Or that it was even a difference. And this is something that, you know, the machines are going to learn things about the world that we never knew. And it's going to be teaching us back and we're going, huh, good work, machine. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about algorithmic bias. I know this is something that you all have run into in your professional lives. Um, you know, uh, AI is only as good as as the as the way we make it. And how how do we how do we create a sort of set of of ethics and rules for this moving forward as it becomes something that is uh, more and more uh, opaque to us? Um, I think it. It doesn't make sense to think about AI in the abstract like that and like to try to regulate all of AI or the fundamental research, but it does make sense to regulate AI as it touches human lives in specific areas. So uh, if you apply AI to medicine, you want to have FDA, Food Drug Administration, to basically regulate what can be done automatically with an AI. Uh, if you want to have self-driving cars, you have to have transportation authorities to regulate and de develop tests before you would allow a self-driving car to drive on the road. And uh, that continues, and hopefully there will be uh, a lot of regulation when it comes to military use, uh, which unfortunately we don't have to work on, but uh, some people probably will, and there will be hopefully better uh, be regulations uh, around that. So I think we have to relook at AI plus X, and then when you look into it, you have to realize that AI is only as good as not as we make it, but as the training data sort of provides. And so if the training data has, for instance, not given in the past as many women alone to start a business, and then you train on that uh, historic training data, then the algorithm might also say, well, I don't want to, you shouldn't give this woman a loan uh, to start a business. And so you need to understand the kinds of data sets that are being fed into the AI to train, to learn, and then make sure you can combat that bias. And you can either do it by changing your training data set, by finding more diverse inputs, or there's sometimes, in uh, certain cases, algorithmic ways to improve the algorithms to actually get rid of some of the biases. So I'm gonna do a very, very quick like bias 101, right? So I work with researchers and then I work with industry people and you know, it's not like I'm always working with tech companies. I'm often working with people whose industries have nothing to do with technology and here I am coming in talking about this concept of bias. And one thing I've realized is that 
the way data scientists, AI researchers, et cetera, the way we talk about bias and the way you know, non-researchers, et cetera, even just lay people talk about bias, actually very different. For us, bias is often a quantifiable value. It is measurable. And what's very safe, because you know, it, it, it's a very safe thing when something's measurable, because then I can try to figure out how to fix it. And most of us in MySpace, we spend our time trying to, to fix this measurable bias. But then there's this other half of bias, and it is just the fact that the world is an unfair place, and you know, shitty things happen to people, and the, the world is structured unfair. People are not born equal, people are not treated equally. Now there is no way to measure that. There is no way to fix that with an algorithm. And the, the best way to fix that is actually to just be better people, and to just create better systems, understanding that that is actually going to be a limitation of our AI. So as Richard said, like it will only be as good as the training data. In other words, it will only be as good as the society that has produced it. So we have to recognize that. So yes, we can do this thing Thing where we measure bias and you know we, we fix that one half of it, but the other half of it comes from what you were saying, Alan, this concept of having a good culture, good ethical codes, et cetera, and a good way of implementing it where we're being thoughtful human beings. So back to kind of what I was saying at the very beginning is that we have to re-examine very fundamental things. Like it is an imperative that we make a good society. It, it has always been an imperative that make good society, but more so today because as we build technologies that will do these kind of amazing things that you were talking about, right? Giving us predictions about what will happen in a particular region of the world or to, you know, who may be the next president or something like that. We do have to make sure that we've, we've sown the seeds and we've started with a good place to start from. Otherwise, we're just going to be perpetuating bias that already exists. The, uh, and also, we're going to make it even harder and harder to fix it and detect it. So can we have good AI, like, can we have good AI in the absence of a good society? No. <laughs> Should we, Should we mean, all agree on that? In the end, AI good. is a tool. Yeah. In the end, AI is a tool, right? So like, and again, it, it's, it's hard to talk about in the abstract. Like, yeah. there's a company uh, that just counts red and white blood cells. It's just like, it's just a good application, right? And you can have uh, AI algorithms that classify different types of breast cancer. And yeah, those are good applications, even if the society has issues, right? And so it is possible, but it's again, like very specific applications that you have to well, look at. But, but even thinking of the medical example, right? Um, there was, there was a, a something I was talking about, how black men in the, in the US get prostate cancer, um, and th they're the, the highest demographic, and yet all the training sets were majority white men, right? So even in the medic, something that seems um, impartial, like medicine, and actually, you know, uh, Alexis Ohini was just up here talking about the difficulties that, that Serena, that his wife had during child, childbirth, and like un her unfortunate situation put a spotlight on the fact that black women are not treated the same. And in fact, we know that women with heart disease are not treated the same as men. So even things that seem objective, actually when you boil down to it, it's always a function of the human condition and the way we treat each other. So even something like medical diagnoses can be flawed because humans are flawed, doctors are flawed. And I think it's interesting, you think about this, and we have this debate, right? Can you make these algorithms less biased? And I, I think the bit that goes, it's always kind of a strange conversation, right? Because we have this in a society that is incredibly biased, right? So we're sitting in a society which is evidently not equal by any means. And we're sitting here and saying, well, what we need to do is create algorithms that are going to um, have no biases. And I think the two of those have to go together, right? If we're going to like build um, algorithms that have biases reduced, it's very, very hard to deploy them in any meaningful way in a society that has incredible amounts of bias. So I don't think you can separate this out. In some ways, like maybe we can pat ourselves on the back and feel good about building an algorithm that has removed bias while we kind of come to work every day stepping over people on the streets that have been treated very, very differently um, as a result of their socioeconomic standing, right? So I, I, think, I think this kind of dynamic is, is something we've got to do from a societal perspective, and you can't isolate just the algorithmic component right. and say, we'll just solve that and things will be fine. But on the positive side, one thing that these algorithms do for us is it highlights bias. It, give, it actually gives us evidence. So while maybe everybody in this room agrees that you know, women and men do not get equal pay at work and they, they, they are not hired, particularly in the tech industry, at equal rates, there are plenty of people who do disagree with that and you know, who may point to their version of science um, to... <laughs>
Because <laughs> if we had in some ways an equal society and we were training algorithms on top of that, a lot of the work would be done. Right, but, but right? Because a, a lot of the errors of the right. algorithms come from encoding the biases that we have in our world today. Right, but what the algorithm is able to do then is give us irrefutable evidence that it does exist, which sometimes we spend our time trying to even defend our right to exist and make the case that we're making. So we have to start from down here every time. So how are we supposed to make large-scale changes in the system if I have to start every conversation by trying to prove my point? Well, now actually what an algorithm can do for us if we wield it intelligently yeah. is to say now we can highlight the biases that exist because we're using, to your point earlier, this sort of, um, I use the word objective meaning almost third party, right? This sort of um, non-socially conditioned method, this mathematical method to show the biases. So it's a moral mirror. It's illustrating our own problems. And now that we started from that point, every conversation doesn't have to start down here. Now at least we can start a little bit higher. So before we go to questions, um, the name of this event is What's Next? And I'm curious to hear what you guys think is next in AI. I'll, I'll start on that. Look, I, I, think, I think the big AI um, is get, advances are going to be driven by dollars, right? And so um, one of the ones that kind of stays off the radar on, on that, but I think is going to have a huge amount, and we're already seeing it of investment, is um, in the military um, space, and particularly with China and um, the US kind of getting into an arms race around dollars spent around artificial intelligence. That's going to drive tremendous amounts of work and research, and we're going to see a huge kind of adoption of AI into um, the defense um, sector. And I would posit that the next conflict um, that will unfold between two nation states um, will be driven by the, um, the, the, uh, the existence of AI and, and the group that has the strongest AI will win that. And so I think very, very um, clearly we're going to move into a place where AI is going to impact and shape the geopolitical landscape of the world vis-a-vis -vis, um, China and the US. So I'm trying to think of how optimistic I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so should, should I go optimistic or pessimistic? You could do both. Should I do both? All right. So I'm, I'm going to, I'll keep it real, she says. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start pessimistic and say that if not wielded correctly, then all these advances in technology that we're seeing um, will have a further divide between the haves and have nots. It is really lovely to read about people going to space and colonizing Mars and, you know, making, you know, try, trying to gene edit babies out of Alzheimer's. But guess what? Unless we create a world in which everybody has access to these technologies, we will literally in utero be creating better human beings for the people who can afford it. Mars travel, guess what? It's not, it's not meant for you and me, buddy, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to fly off to Mars and leave us <laughs> pores behind, right? That, that's, that's me being very pessimistic. Like that, that is super pessimistic. Pessimistic Ramon. So more, optimi <laughs> <laughs> more optimistic Ramon says that um, artificial intelligence will actually allow us access to things that we never had access to before. Data, information, education. I mean, there's some amazing strides being made in education. And interestingly, so at, at NeurIPS, which is sort of the, one of the big AI conferences, there was a, a huge issue with, with uh, researchers from Africa trying to get visas to go because Canada is very, very unnecessarily, some would say, strict on researchers from Africa. And even though they had literally like AI household names, writing them letters, telling the Canadian government to grant them visas, they were being told no. And what that was highlighting is A, the fact that the democratization of these skills is global, it's universal, and that's a very beautiful thing. But uh, the second thing it's showing us is that our political institutions, our global structures are straining against this because they actually can't handle it. Glo globalization um, transcend, obviously transcends these boundaries, as education transcends these boundaries. And now we're almost, we're pushing the boundaries and pushing the borders. And it's amazing. So it's Dr. Tim Gebru who was working on getting visas for these students. And it was great that she was able to use social media to, to evangelize for her cause and gain support. So optimistic Ramon says that AI gives us the ability to learn and to share and to just push institutions to be better. 
So I think we'll have to separate um, sort of the hype from, from reality in terms yes, of both the positives and the negatives. So on the hype side, uh, I don't think we're anywhere close to what we call artificial general intelligence, some kind of conscious, uh, self-conscious entity that is more intelligent than humans in all kinds of ways and will hence decide on its own goals of what to do and then maybe decide to wipe out the human race. I think that is sci-fi. It's, it's interesting sci-fi. I like watching Terminator 2, but it's, it's just like sci-fi, you know. Um, it's like all the, you know, Good zombies fear. will come when cancer research happens. And like, it's, it's cool sci-fi. Sometimes those movies are entertaining, but it's, it's just fiction. And so uh, that comes with both positives and negatives. Like some people are so optimistic that they think AI will just automate all the things and we don't have to work and we'll have this amazing wonderland. And, um, and you're going to go into negative where they worry that it will kill us all, right? And it's an existential threat to humankind. So uh, much more realistically uh, so, I do think AI will actually impact pretty much every job that there is. Um, from agriculture and, you know, you, there are already companies that can drive over fields. Uh, Blue River that was uh, acquired uh, maybe a year or two ago, uh, they can drive over fields and pick lettuce leaves just when they're at the ripe at the right time. They can water them the right way. They can get weeds around them automatically for each lettuce leaf and pick the weeds around them to not have to use as many pesticides and so on. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in just agriculture and then you know, going to a very expensive job like radiology or medicine, there's also a lot of things we can do. And in those kinds of application areas, most people would care more about creating healthier patients more quickly and cheaply uh, with you know high quality rather than creating more jobs in medicine right you want to just make the outcome better and i think ai has the potential to do a lot of that now it's true that just like with dna sequencing and stuff i think a lot of the most modern technology will often first be available for a few rich old white guys um and then uh, maybe come and be cheaper right the first dna sequencing cost over a million dollars and now you can get it for less than 100 and so I think AI will realistically become a very powerful tool in basically all these industries. And in terms of yeah, positive and negative, I, I agree with, with everything that Roman <laughs> said. Um, I think we're very aligned. Uh, unfortunately, it's a tool that's only as good as the people and societies and uh, an infrastructure that uses it. And hence, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. It's basically an omni-use kind of technology. Yep. Do we have any questions? I hope so. I can't see. In the middle, there's one. Yes. Maybe just yell it out and we'll repeat yeah. it. I've got, I've got the microphone. Oh, great. <laughs> Even better. Um, my name is Alexis, most popular name of the night. Um, <laughs> and I actually work for Accenture. Um, so my question is that uh, I get the sense that there is this mass fear that um, the robots are going to kill, our, kill us all and or take all of our jobs, right? Um, and that is one extreme that... AI does have the ability to do in, in the far future. However, uh, to Alexis Ohanian's point earlier about uh, the benefit of AI being able to take away those sort of um, jobs basically that people don't want to do, the, men, the mundane things, the non-regular jobs that um, we just voluntarily don't want to do in order to make our lives easier, seems like a more practical application. And, and that would suggest to me that maybe the, the ideal melding of the two, of human interaction leading AI, would be best. And so my question is, what do you see as the optimal melding of uh, human uh, brain capacity using artificial intelligence? I mean, in some ways, it's uh, imagine like you, you're in, you work in service, and every day you pick up a call, and somebody again asks like, "How do I recover my password? I can't log into my account." And you're like, "I've answered this like a hundred times." I think people will get very annoyed if they have to, in the future of work, repeat the same task hundreds of times. They're like, "Why has this not been picked up by the AI yet?" I think is what people will think, and we'll see a continuous sort of co-adaptation also. Where if you want the AI to work, you're going to maybe you know speak more clearly into the microphone if you want you know some AI assistant to do something for you. So we we'll have this co-adaptation and see less and less repetitive work and more and more like, oh, this is an interesting new problem. I don't know how to solve this. Let me like go through your logs and see what's going on. And uh, I think that that is kind of the ideal melding where AI feels like it's empowering you to do your job better and focus on the more interesting and creative and unique kinds of tasks. So I'm, I'm going to Jekyll Hyde this again. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I totally agree. So the goal 
of AI, and it has to be a very conscious thing, like the phrase that gets tossed on all the time is human-centric, like what the hell does human-centric even mean? But really, it is to create AI in the image of humans. So I'll give you an example, like often, and we all do this, we will adjust ourselves to the technology. So if you have an Alexa or something at home, do you ever find yourself speaking like this? You know, <laughs> like short sentences, baby words, right? And it's, it, you know, we are, we are, getting primed to actually adjust ourselves to the technology when it really should be adjusting to us. And that's the direction that hopefully a lot of this technology is heading. Now, to, to that, that, was the, that was the good good half, the bad half. So I, I understand this narrative of we want to automate mundane jobs. And, but for all of us, we must be at a special point of privilege if we want to say, I want to automate some mundane, oh yeah, like nobody wants to work. Well, actually millions of people do work at call centers. And it's not to say that they love their jobs and they wake up every morning like woohoo, but you know what? It feeds their family, it, it puts a roof over their head. And if we are going to have a narrative of you know, getting rid of mundane jobs, then we have to think deeply about what we will do to enable those people whose jobs will be uh, wiped out. And the thing is the balance going back to this concept of globalization, the balance will not look equal, right? We won't, we won't see it in our backyards. We're not even gonna see it in most of America. It will be in the Philippines, it will be in India, it'll be in the global south where people often don't have a voice. So, you know, it is our response. I, I, I do believe in this AI future where we're able to automate things more, et cetera, but we can't do it and just raise over the people who have been picking our fruits and vegetables answering our calls and doing all the things that we consider mundane because we are privileged to have jobs that we find fulfilling. Well said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think there's, it's interesting what, I, when we look at this stuff, I think artificial intelligence is, it's not, its goal is not to mimic humans. I think if, if all we did with artificial intelligence was mimic humans, we would have probably squandered one of the greatest inventions we've ever made. I think what's interesting about artificial intelligence as it evolves is that it's different to us. It thinks differently, it sees differently, it does things we can't do. So we're in a little bit of a place where we just, you know, take it as like, you know, new technology, let's replicate the things that we've just had. But I think we need to push it beyond that. And, and for me, that, that's kind of, um, I think it's a symbiosis of, of human intelligence and machine intelligence. And I think if you combine them together, you actually can, can get a higher intelligence than either one had by themselves. And my favorite example of this is in the world of weather prediction. And the people at NOAA keep incredible records of prediction. And of course, they have some of the biggest supercomputers in the world, and if not the biggest set of supercomputers, is a very difficult problem. And so they measure two things. One is they measure, of course, did it rain or not? Um, but the second thing they measure is how well was the performance of the machine uh, before a human, and then how well was the performance after the human? And what they've found consistently since the mid-90s when they started measuring this stuff was around a 10 to 15% delta on what the humans could add to the best machines. And I think inside of that is, um, I think really the, the essence here is, is that if we can interact with machines in the right way, we will be smarter than the machine and we'll be smarter than ourselves. And we're going into a world where we need all of the intelligence we can get. And so I think it's on us to really design that interaction in a way that lifts that intelligence, um, both with our individual reactions, but also collectively as we interact. And as we come together as, as collective intelligences and machines and humans, how do we ensure we have the smartest group and crowd rather than the dumbest one. And I think often we've designed systems where we've ended up in a really dumb place when we've brought intelligences <laughs> together. So we, it's on us to make all of that interaction the smartest we can possibly make it. And um, I think that's where we, we, we take the benefit of both sides. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.